humanist wedding ceremony. I've said to Shiv's family that I wanted it to be as kind of traditional and authentic as possible. So to just tell me what to do when I'm up for doing it. So um, hopefully it all just kind of falls into place and I don't look out of place. <laughs> me too. Okay, are you ready? Yeah. Can I come out? Uh-huh. What do you think? Oh my god. Oh. We'll see, I'll be wearing oh, heels. Wow. I love it. I think it's very pretty. I'm really excited now. And I can't wait to get my nails done a bit later because it's going to match the, uh, the this outfit and then put the shoes on with it. And I think it's all coming together now. So, yeah. It's the day of Shiv and Zara's Sangeet, which marks the coming together of two families. How are you feeling? I'm quite nervous. Yeah. But I'm really happy you're here and that you're helping me get ready. Yeah. <laughs> Have you had a drink? Yeah. Not yet. Relaxed. Not yet. <laughs> so. I think a glass of Prosecco is needed yeah. before we leave. So I'm going to be wearing this tonight. This will take me five minutes to put on. I'll moisturise myself, you know, maybe brush my teeth. And that's pretty much it. I feel very um, uh, lucky to, to be a man sometimes. I think the nerves are going to start to kick in when I put it on. Uh, at the moment, I'm all right-ish. I'm not shaking. But um, yeah, hope Zara likes it. That's the main thing. She's really, really given 110%. Um, and she embraces the kind of Indian culture. She loves it. She's been doing her makeup for, what, a couple of hours, three hours? I'm sure she'll look great. But she naturally looks beautiful all the time. It's really nice. It's really happy. It's, I'm very happy, yeah. <laughs> all this Sangeet needs now nice is one. a bride. Everybody's having a good time. Sangeet is where people will be up there on that dance floor. This is where everyone, you know, gets their dance moves out and, you know, giving it their hardest. They've been practicing their moves in front of the mirror. It's been non stop, just constantly um, singing, dancing, uh, meeting people, seeing people we know. But this celebration is far from over. In less than 12 hours, Shiv and Zara will say I do in a humanist wedding ceremony. I think the beautiful thing about Shiv and Zara is that it is not just one person coming into a new, a new culture um, and accepting new traditions. It is two people meeting in the middle and, and becoming part of the Scottish culture. It's ever-evolving, it's ever-changing. Brides and grooms want something which is a bit more bespoke, a bit more tailored to kind of their events, so I, I don't see this balloon bursting anytime soon. Could we talk about the fact that they killed a man? Why would we want to do that? Walter passed peacefully, if only they knew. Your hands keep turning the light of shades of white. Your pair of shoes are turning back to black. Don't you feel that nice? The color of the inner voice that's slowly coming back. The guilt. I'm Walter's niece, or was, I guess. She's it. The one thing that can trip us up. Fragments. Could be car paint. Can I have this tested? Could be nothing. Could be everything. You're a bad dancer. No, I'm just Scottish. One wrong word from you, and we go to prison. I'm not sure whose side you're on. Careful, Max. Penny, what do you think happened? Maybe there was some funny business going on. Keep looking. I don't know what Max is doing, but he's up to something. Are you okay? I saw. Yeah, we're okay. Pandas are special and unique. Some of the keepers after a while get a wee bit like, oh, here we go again. <laughs> panda this, panda that. <laughs> Got panda stuff, yeah. Pictures and postcards, ornaments, and well, my oldest son loves pandas, so I have about 10 teddies in the house for him. <laughs> Two of the zoo's star attractions since they arrived on loan from China in 2011 are the giant pandas. 
Yangguan and Tian Tian. The only ones in the UK, they're used to getting lots of attention from an adoring public. Everybody loves a panda. I don't know, it's just like, even just to get a glimpse of it, everybody's just like, wow, it's a panda. Everybody gets really excited. <laughs> These two precious bears are also kept under constant surveillance by the keepers. This is how I spend my afternoon, you see. And as it turns out, they don't just laze around all day. <laughs> We've tried just about every year. It would be absolutely amazing if she actually has a youngster. I think everybody's quite excited and you know, hoping for the best. Every year we kind of go through the same symptoms. <laughs> You can actually see here, this is one of the teats there. You know, every year you get the build-up coming up to, you know, will she, will she not kind of thing. So we know that there's a chance that it might not happen, but you're always in the back of your head that, that this might be the year we might do it this year. <laughs> in case Tian Tian should need some extra help raising her cub, a combination of technology and willing keepers are ready and waiting. This is the incubator that we would use if we were having to hand rear a panda. We have it set up and ready every year. The hope is that we don't have to put something in it because it would be much better for any young panda to be reared uh, by mum. When they're tiny, I mean, they need fed every two hours. So there's not much sleep for people who are looking after a baby. It's quite a responsibility. But for Alison and Sharon, that really wouldn't be a hardship. Pandas are their passion. <laughs> we are Style Fixers. We're just trying to transform your uniform into something a bit more fabulous. I need to see that personality in your clothes. We love finding fashion gems in secondhand stores. Oh my God, Jamie! These are only two pounds. We live for repurposing and upcycling, turning the drab into fab. And it's just going to be complete fabulosity. So we're each taking on someone whose look... I tend to dress a bit like a school teacher. That's like a we're going out jumping. <laughs> ...needs a little love. I cannot wait for Amy to meet bad Amy. In our pop-up studio, we will transform people's style, giving them confidence they never knew they had. You've done well. When the makeovers are complete, they decide who's done the best job. This is the moment of truth. What score are you going to give me? It's so good. We always decide to launch every city with Chippy. The first course is like chips and cheese. So we make a parmesan espuma. We do parmesan crisps. We make like a potato croquette. Then we portion that, fry it, and then we dust it in vinegar powder. Next course is our monkfish cheek scampi. So we obviously bring in our monk cheeks every day, pea ketchup, and like a sauce grabiche. We found more Coca-Cola products in the environment than the next two top polluters combined. So can Coke keep its promise to improve Panorama Coca-Cola's 100 billion bottle problem tomorrow at 7.35 on BBC One and iPlayer? 
All the latest entertainment news is on the way at 7.15 here on BBC Scotland in the edit. That's after we count down Sunday's top stories in the 7. The headlines this evening. The Health Secretary admits that there is a risk of a spike in COVID cases as a result of the climate summit due to be held in Glasgow. There is absolutely a risk of COVID cases uh, rising thereafter, uh, but we'll do everything we can to mitigate that. And concerns are raised about the speed of the COVID booster rollouts. Hello and welcome to The Seven. As delegates from around the world prepare to descend on Glasgow for the COP26 climate conference, Scotland's Health Secretary has admitted that there is absolutely a risk of a spike in COVID cases to follow. But Hamza Youssef said the Scottish Government would try to do everything in its power to keep that to a minimum, as Katie Hunter reports. Closed and quiet, but not for much longer. More than 20,000 people are expected in Glasgow for next week's UN Climate Change Conference. Let's talk to the Health Secretary, Hamza Youssef. But there's concern COP will cause a rise in COVID cases. There's nobody in the world, not a public health expert in the world, that would say there's no risk in the midst of a global pandemic to have tens of thousands of people descending onto to, to largely one city, but, but of course uh, they will be across the entire country. So there is absolutely a risk of COVID cases yeah. Uh, rising uh, uh, thereafter, uh, but we'll do everything we can to mitigate that. Some parts of health and social care are already facing challenges like never before. NHS Lanarkshire has moved to its highest risk level and called in military support. If COP does lead to a rise in COVID cases, it's possible we could see an increase in COVID patients in hospitals in December. That's right around the time the NHS would generally be dealing with the extra pressures of winter. It'll be several weeks before we know exactly how this conference will affect the NHS. It is going to lead to uh, an increase in COVID cases, uh, no matter what mitigation and what steps you take to try and minimise the risk of that. Inevitably, there's going to be uh, a spike. And of course, the other big issue that we have beyond COP26 um, is the forthcoming winter crisis uh, and the impact of respiratory viruses and how that's going to impact on the health service as a whole. The Scottish Government says it isn't actively considering new restrictions, but there are no guarantees it'll stay that way. Katie Hunter, BBC News. Health boards across Scotland have been warning of serious pressures, particularly on emergency departments. Greater Glasgow and Clyde have urged patients to only go to A&E if their condition is serious or life-threatening. I asked Dr Montgomery what he thought of this message and how these pressures are impacting on GPs. That's a very difficult message to put out to the general public. I mean, I think it's important that we emphasise the reality that the NHS as a whole is in crisis, that's certainly very, very true. And all arms of the NHS are in crisis. But at the same time, um, we do want patients to feel able to come forward and see us when they need to see us. From a general practice perspective, if you find yourself in a position in which if you're a woman and you discover a breast lump, then we need to see you. You cannot and should not delay. If you're a middle-aged man who starts coughing up blood and you're a smoker, then clearly the same applies. You you need to see us. So we need to be careful um, that we don't put people off who need medical care urgently. And John, you said there that all arms of the NHS are in crisis at the moment. What pressures are you under? A year and a half ago, March 2020, at the start of the pandemic, when that message was going out to um, stay at home, protect the NHS and save lives, there was undoubtedly a, a drop uh, in, in use of general practice services. Our consultation went down to 920. Um, but since then, there's been a steady, steady rise so that we're now seeing some 2,000 patients um, per month, a 73% increase compared to the pre-pandemic levels. Um, so it, that's another example of the enormous pressures that, that, we're, that we're under. Um, but again, going back, there is, a, there is a trade-off. There is no doubt that back in March 2020, some patients did delay coming forward, leading to delays in particularly cancer diagnosis 
and which was obviously going to adversely affect the outcome. So there's a very difficult and a very delicate balance to be struck when we're putting out messages like this. There's a lot of discussion just now about the pressure specifically on hospitals, on accident and emergency. Do you have concerns for the wider community? Yes, I do. Um, I think one of the big concerns that all of us have is that because um, flu was at such low levels uh, last winter uh, and respiratory syncytial virus, a virus that particularly targets young children, again, these were low levels because of all the social distancing measures were in place that were in place. And we now have a population that doesn't have the levels of immunity that we'd have had in previous winters. So that in itself is going to be a concern. We have COVID, of course, still up there. We see rises, rising cases coming through all the time. And we really have to do all we can um, to boost the vaccination campaign. We have to encourage patients who have not been vaccinated against COVID to come forward. We need to make sure that we minimise any barriers that there are to vaccination and we need to make sure that we have as great an uptake of flu vaccine coverage as we possibly can. Dr John Montgomery speaking there. Vaccines have been key in the fight against COVID and those in the highest risk groups are now eligible for a booster dose. But concerns have been raised about the speed of the booster rollout. Here's our political reporter, Jenny Davidson. That's you. With booster vaccines, timing is everything. Not too early, but not too late. The recommendation from the experts at the JCVI is that the booster dose should come six months after a second jag. Too early will make it less effective. Giving it too early could be one problem. Giving it to people who really aren't in need of protection could be a problem because you're essentially wasting vaccine doses if you do that. Um, and the most important thing of all is that you do want this booster not only to have some effect, but for that effect to last us through the winter. But there are concerns that Scotland's vaccine booster programme may be leaving it too late. Actually, some people are waiting longer than the six-month interval recommended by the JCVI for their booster. And that means that their protection is waning and they are more likely to get COVID than not. So the reality is we need to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible. This morning, Health Secretary Hamza Youssef said he was confident the four highest priority groups would get their booster dose by mid-November and the remaining priority groups by early next year. This is later than the dates originally announced for the booster programme, but the Health Secretary said he completely rejected any suggestion that the vaccine booster rollout was sluggish. We only got the JCVI advice on the green light for a booster uh, towards the end of September. Now, by that point, you already had, uh, I think, hundreds of thousands of people who were eligible for a booster vaccine. We couldn't have given it to them any earlier than when we started. With the booster programme playing catch up, the question is whether it will get there soon enough. Jenny Davidson, BBC News. A look now at some of today's other stories. And Labour is calling on the UK government to bring in its Plan B measures to tackle COVID in England. This would mean a return to compulsory mask wearing and working from home. Ministers say the current data does not suggest that they should be moving immediately to these tougher measures, which should also include mandatory COVID passports. From today, fully vaccinated travellers returning to England can take a lateral flow test rather than a more expensive PCR test to prove their COVID status. The change applies to those arriving from non-red list countries. Travellers to Scotland currently still need to take a PCR test, though there are plans to align with England. The move is not risk-free, though. The UK's largest supermarket chain, Tesco, says an attempt to hack its computer systems is behind problems with its website and app. Shoppers have been unable to book deliveries or amend existing orders for more than 24 hours. Tesco say it's working hard to restore its services. One of the world's most wanted drug lords has been captured in Colombia. Around 500 special forces were involved in the operation to seize Dero Antonio Osuga, known as Antonio, who'd been hiding out in the jungle. Colombia's president said it was the biggest blow to drug traffickers for three decades. 
and Glasgow band Mogwai have claimed the Scottish Album of the Year awards. The group's 10th studio album, As the Love Continues, which shot straight to the top of the UK album charts when it was released in February, clinched the award for the band for the first time. The honour was given at a ceremony in Edinburgh last night. And now let's have a look at all of the day's sport. Now it's football first and if you're waiting for sports scene, which is on later, then now is your time to look away. Rangers played St Mirren in the only Premiership match of the day. St Mirren went ahead in the fourth minute with a stunning strike from Conor Ronan. A penalty put Rangers back on level terms before Alfredo Morelos sealed the win with his 100th goal for the club. The Ibrox side are now three points clear at the top of the table. In the Formula One, Red Bull's Max Verstappen is on pole position for tonight's United States Grand Prix in Texas. He starts ahead of title rival Lewis Hamilton after beating the world champion in the final lap. Hamilton is second on the grid for Mercedes and six points behind Verstappen in the Drivers' Championship. 140,000 people are expected to turn out for the final race in Austin, which starts in less than an hour. And finally tonight, there were three games in the English Premier League today. James Madison scored his first goal since February as Leicester beat Brentford 2-1. West Ham move up to fourth in the table with a 1-0 win at home to Tottenham. And Manchester United were trounced at home by Liverpool, 5-0 the score at Old Trafford. And that's all of the sport this evening. There's much more football to come on Sports Scene. Now, 11 masterpieces by Spanish painter Pablo Picasso have sold for a total of £80 million at auction in Las Vegas. The one to hit the highest price was the painting Woman with a Red Orange Cap, which went for almost £30 million. It was a portrait of one of his, the artist's lovers, which was painted in 1938. Seven Days is on later. Well, what's on? Here's Laura and Fiona to tell you more. Coming up on Seven Days, UK COVID cases surge past 50,000 per day for the first time since July. We ask, are we heading for the return of restrictions? We discuss disturbing reports of women being drugged by injection with a needle in nightclubs. And after a Strictly contestant is called a chubby little thing, we discuss body shaming. All that and more with our panel, Siobhan Mathers, Dan McCrossgrey and Gemma Fay at 11pm on the BBC Scotland channel. And how's the weather looking for the start of the week? Well, here's Judith Ralston. Good evening. A fantastic picture there behind me, capturing the shower clouds that we saw across the Northwest Highlands. But actually, for many of us, it was quite a fine day with spells of sunshine. The magical picture there behind me from Orkney. We'll still see a number of showers across Western Scotland this evening. But as we head through the course of this evening, we'll tend to see those showers becoming a wee bit more widespread for a time before easing during the overnight period, along with the winds. Plenty of clear spells for Southern and Eastern Scotland. It will be a cool night temperatures falling to around about 6 to 8 Celsius or thereabouts. So tomorrow a cool fresh start to the day with plenty of sunshine for southern and eastern Scotland, a number of showers across the northwest and those showers will start to become more widespread for a time. Quite a keen westerly wind tomorrow as well pushing those showers through fairly quickly but then we'll start to see dry conditions as we head to the course of the afternoon. Temperatures will be on the cool side. Then on Tuesday it'll be windy with outbreaks of rain and it will return to milder temperatures as well and that's all for this evening the edit is up next and laura mcgee will be here with the seven tomorrow night from all of the team thanks for joining us and have a very good night bye bye i'd never imagined this Whatever this is. I don't know what to think. This doesn't have to end in sadness. A touching new drama. Float. Watch on iPlayer. You're not safe from me. <laughs> we need someone who looks like an outsider. Who looks clean and who is neither. We don't want to know. 
If we don't know it, if we don't lie to him, maybe we get out of this. Guilt continues Tuesday at 10 on the BBC Scotland Channel and iPlayer. From food to housing, from leisure to climate change, from the development of our cities to the state of our health, land is at the very heart of the way we live our lives. And the people who control it have the power to make decisions that can affect us all. Join us as together we explore our planet now, including the two-part special, Who Owns Scotland? Starts tonight at nine on the BBC Scotland channel and iPlayer. Including St Mirren v Rangers, sports scene looked at the weekend Scottish Premiership games. Get all the latest with the team in 15 minutes. Amy and David first with the edit. Roll out the red carpet. It is time for the edit. I am. Amy Irons. Oh, oh thank yes. you. Here I am, David Farrell. God, indeed. <laughs> Let's see who's making the cut this week. Just, just beep, 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 beep off. <laughs> TV's most brutal businessman, Logan Roy, is in the edit's boardroom as he declares war. From one gaffer to another, Eva Longoria talks playing CEO of the family in The Boss Baby 2. And her animated on-screen husband, James Marsden, talks about going from fan to cast member. What a show we have tonight. Oh, Honestly. as always. And we're going to kick off with one of TV's most successful programmes of recent years. Yeah. I mean, I do have the army of four.